It is just three days to the off-cycle elections in Kogi State and, of course, Biosan Emo. The last time the residents elected a governor on the 16th of November in 2019, violence nearly marred the exercise. Of course, that returned incumbent governor Yahya Bello for his second and final term. Thugs brazenly wielding rifles and other lethal weapons disrupted and chased away voters and electoral officials in many polling units in Lokoja, as reported back then. The state, uh, of course, Lokoja is the state capital, and of course, many parts of the states uh, where violence was also reported and uh, the stealing of ballot boxes. Now, some of the armed men reportedly wore police uniforms and drove around in Toyota Hilux vans and affected by official restriction of movement on election day. Now, as voters in the north-central Nigerian state return to the polls this Saturday to elect Mr. Bello's successor, there are understandable fears of a replay of the 2019 disaster. A total of 1.9 million voters were registered for the poll, with 51% of them registered in Kogi East Senatorial District. Now, this morning, we're speaking with the governorship candidate of the Action Alliance in Kogi State, Olainka Brimo. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us, Mr. Brimo. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Uh, it's been a pretty interesting last uh, couple of weeks, months for you, I believe, in the build-up to the elections. It's just a, a couple of days away. Um, but it's it's not been, you know, a very, very rosy process. Uh, you know, there's been reports of violence. I think the SDP candidate reported the same thing. The PDP candidate's reports on also being attacked and, and whatnot. Um, can you share what your personal experience has been like, you know, in the last couple of weeks and months uh, to the elections? Yeah, in terms of violence, uh, of course, there's been a couple of violence here and there. And uh, yesterday, we couldn't hold our meeting at the Kina local government because there were shootouts in the early hours of yesterday. So we had to disperse because of uh, intelligence reports of what had happened in the earlier hours of uh, yesterday. So the, the violence, you have a bit of uh, violence here and there. Uh, I think the main concern and focus right now should be violence on election day, which is what we've been calling attention of the security agencies too, that uh, for them to be vigilant on election day, because of course, from what we hear, uh, the ruling party wants to destroy and cause chaos in areas where they're not popular, which is uh, their focus, that the areas are not popular they will want to scatter the votes so that uh, everybody will record zero votes. Uh, that's the, the focus currently uh, from what we gather. And, and uh, you know, you raised valid points as regards the polls, the security on the day of the elections, which is very critical. We did speak with a representative in Imo State a few days ago who shared with us that there was a state of apprehension in Imo State and a number of citizens were afraid. Uh, about the elections. Is there really that palpable fear? And uh, are there concerns that citizens may or may not turn up at the polls on the day of the elections? Yeah, uh, we, they are fears, but we believe strongly that what the security agencies will be able to do between today and tomorrow will determine whether people will turn out or not. Because if people see enough security presence around the state, uh, I think it will build their confidence in coming out and mass to vote. Because uh, violence or the scare or the fear of violence in itself does not help anybody. And we try to let everybody know because if the people are scared of coming out, uh, that means even you, that you are the current ruling party, you will not have votes as well. Because uh, everybody will need to go through the accreditation process before they can be counting of votes, before they can vote. So if people are scared and don't come out, it means there will be accreditation. So it will affect everybody. So it is important uh, just to lend them uh, this uh, wisdom that it is important to allow people to come out and for the security agencies to uh, show presence. At least we were in Omala yesterday. Uh, we saw to some reasonable extent uh, presence of uh, military men uh, on patrol and we believe they can do more and if, if they're able to do more a lot of people will have the confidence to to come out 
Right. Do, you, do you also have confidence in, in um, INEC, the electoral you know, umpire? Um, of course, uh, we're taking, the, taking uh, a feed from what happened early in the year in February. Uh, there's a lot of criticism that the electoral umpire has faced you know, for carrying out, you know, people have said, very, very um, fraudulent elections. You know. um, do you have confidence that INEC will be able to deliver free, fair and credible elections on Saturday? Well, so far, I don't think they've shown us any reason why we should not uh, trust them uh, or take their word for it, especially the uh, words of the chairman. But what is most sustainable and most important is processes, following the standard operating uh, uh, procedures. Uh, the processes are the most important thing, and that's what our focus is. Because, I mean, humans, we are we're fallible. And... Uh, uh, focusing on the processes, ensuring that the processes are followed, uh, the guidelines are followed. Uh, for instance, once results are uploaded from the polling unit to the IRF, I think that gives us some level of confidence as part of the processes being followed. If they will follow those processes, I will believe based on the commitment and personal commitment that the chairman of INEC has made and said publicly, uh, I think I don't have any reason to doubt them or doubt him in terms of them following all the required processes. But you know, human beings are, uh, uh, can frustrate processes. And those are the concerns uh, in some areas that uh, some people, because of inducement or whatever, might make attempt to want to frustrate the processes. So, what we, we encourage INEC to do is to just have a, a multi layer. And thank God there are observers to be able to ensure uh, processes are followed across the length and breadth of, of the state. All right. Let's talk about the strength of Action Alliance as a political party in Kogi State. First of all, would you say that Kogi State is ripe enough to see uh, politics where the party that isn't the ruling party comes into power? We've seen that play out in some cases in some parts of the nation during the, these last elections where the ruling party was sort of shelved to the corner and the opposition or a, an opposition that wasn't seen as a formidable opposition coming to the forefront. So do you think that Action Alliance ha is able to wield enough influence at these elections to be able to, you know, topple the ruling party? Uh, what you have described is the exact thing that's going to happen this time around uh, because uh, for the very first time you see uh, candidates from a relatively unknown party, uh, like a common say, the unusual. I am an unusual candidate uh, because we have an unusual situation. New to the politics of the state, uh, or the new party in the state, I'm an unusual candidate because an unusual candidate is required to stop the unusual trend of poverty in our state. So, what you are going to see this Saturday is me emerging as the next governor of Kogi State. Uh, and none of the candidates have done the kind of campaigns we've done across the state. None of them have been able to engage across the state. We've gone around all the senatorial districts. We've had engagement, at multi-level engagement, uh, more than any other candidates in the state. And I'm quite hopeful and I'm, I'm confident in the fact that victory is the only option for us on Saturday. Oh, well, I mean, I'm sure everyone, you know, would um, believe in the same thing. You know, the PDP candidate, I'm sure, also has similar thoughts. Same with the APC candidate, you know, that they've engaged. They have, of course, uh, sold themselves well enough, and the people of uh, Kogi State will, you know, give them victory. Um, but there are other factors, and like you mentioned, there are other factors that must come into play to ensure that the election is free and fair and credible. Um, you know, there's also something that, you know, has been mentioned, which is the, the uh, election machinery that you know, is normally brought into play to enable one party or the other to win. Um, and so are those some things that you also have, you know, maybe fears of that, you know, these, the election machinery can be weaponized against you. you know, and I'm talking about, or against, against, against your party. And we're talking now about um, polling agents, we're talking about, you know, thuggery, we're talking about INEC ad hoc staff and some of the things that we always, you know, seem to fault in the electoral process. Are those things that, you know, you are concerned about? Or do you have confidence 
that the people of Kogi State would come out in mass and they are, you know, 100% going to vote for Action Alliance or Lion Cabrimo. Yeah, I have confidence in the fact that people of Kogi State will come out in mass to vote for Action Alliance on Saturday. Reason being that poverty has ravaged our people for too long and they understand our message, the clear message of wealth creation and wealth distribution, taking them out of poverty through our start agenda. STAT, solid minerals tourism, agriculture and trade as means of driving in cash flow into our economy because the government can make money if the people are not making money. We've been able to communicate this to the people of Kogi State and they understand it quite well. There is no way the state government can make money if they are not making money. So our focus is to help our people to start making money. And this message is clear and they are able to understand it. Uh, I don't think there's any other candidate uh, from any of those parties that you mentioned that has been able to communicate, uh, I mean, in, just in one sentence, what exactly they want to do. And our people understand this. Now, yeah, but the, the challenge here is, is it, the, the, the challenge here, I apologize, I apologize. Uh, Mr. Brian, I, I don't know how long you've been in the political space. Um, the, the people you are going up against, Dino Malaye has been a politician, you know, I, I would say ma ma majority of his career has been in the National Assembly. Um, of course, Yaya Bello, you know, is def definitely going to be campaigning for, you know, um, um, his candidate. Um, but, but do you have the same, you know, do, do the people of Kogi State know you? Do they know you and, you know, what you've, you know, offered to Kogi State in maybe the last decade? Okay, all that those people that have been in power, that have been in politics, have delivered to the people of the state is poverty. I mean, so all their actions or inactions have delivered poverty to us in over two decades. Over two decades, is that not enough time to establish trends? The trends have been that poverty has been on the increase in our state by virtue of their actions or inactions being in government. So uh, the clear message is this, and um, which the people understand. I'm not just talking about the problems, I'm talking about the solutions. I mean, solutions like the fact that our budget for this year is 172 billion naira. 88% of the budget is dependent on federal allocation. And when you depend largely on the federal allocation, what it delivers to you is poverty. Because you can imagine a federal government that is owing 87 trillion naira, uh, closing Q1 2023, it means that the federal allocation will keep going down. It means that we must start making money. Uh, as government, how can we make money? If we don't make, if our people are not making money, we cannot make money. And uh, those that have been in power for so long, and people have been able to see what they're able to do, all they've been able to deliver to the state is poverty. So the, the decision processes, I think it's clear. Uh, there's a clear choice for our people in Kogi State. Our people are smart people. Our people can uh, understand clearly and I know quite all right that our people make the right decision because they know at this the level of poverty in Kogi State is unprecedented. I mean, you can imagine families, people sending you SMS to beg for a transfer of 500 naira for them to be able to feed their family. Many families today in Kogi State are poor, they beg before they can eat. We're not even talking about education. Uh, I mean, a whole lot of... Uh, Students can even continue their education uh, in Kogi. Those that have been able to manage to finish school are back at home, jobless, virtually every community that you go to. So we've been having this engagement, and they understand that people are tired of this. And because they know the fact that whatever they give you to vote, to influence your vote for a day, maximum after a week, you're back to status quo. You're back Very to true. poverty. So, and they're making the choice to be able to go for uh, someone that will give them hope and guarantee them uh, success. Uh, uh, prosperity in the state for us to be able to start a new chapter of prosperity. Through. And now that you uh, mentioned, you know, poverty, you've mentioned hope and you've mentioned prosperity. Poverty is not something you're not familiar with, at least from the stories that we've seen about you. You've had a very difficult growing up as well and at some point had to drop out of school because you weren't able to pay your school fees. Now, because of this, you've also started paying school fees for a number of children, I believe, from, you know, some of the things that we've seen about you online. But let's talk about what your plan is. Poverty is a problem that is deeply rooted in Kogi State. The citizens of Kogi State are suffering from it. You have talked about it, you know. What is the plan now that we know what the, what the problem is? And I'm asking this because every other day we see politicians who come 
and share with us their stories as well of understanding the pain of the people, of understanding the poverty that the people have been with. They promise hope, but at the end of the day, they're not able to deliver. So what do you offer? What are you bringing to the people of Kogi and how can they hold you accountable? All right. Uh, the clear message of wealth creation, which is true, our start agenda, solid minerals. For solid minerals, we help our people to assess license from the federal government, help our people to bring in technical partners for them, give them necessary guarantees that will help them to be able to assess funding for exploration and exploitation. Uh, because to empower our people, you need to be able to help them to create products that will take out of the state for monies to come into the state. Because our people are poor because we don't have enough money in circulation in our economy. So we help them to drive in money into our economy. Tourism is there. Tourism, the commercial organization and operation of holidays and visits to places of interest, simple definition of tourism. And we have several locations that are not developed that will help drive traffic. When you drive traffic into the state, you are driving money into the state. Uh, so we target 2 million visitors annually in the next three to four years, and 2 million visitors visiting our state annually. If they spend only 100,000 Naira inside our state, it means we have been able to attract about 200 billion Naira into our economy. If they stay, just average of five nights in Kogi State, that means we would have sold 10 million nights of hotels and shoplets per annum. And at an average of 100,000 Naira per night, that means we've attracted about 1 trillion Naira into our economy. You see, this is helping our people to start making money. Because when people come in to spend money, who are those that will make money? Traders will make money. They will do transport. They will pay hotel bills. And when you think about agriculture, just targeting food sufficiency means we'll be able to retain. I mean, at 500 Naira per person per day, we spend about 2.2 billion Naira daily and about 66 billion Naira monthly on food. Now, achieving food sufficiency in three years through our regenerative agriculture plan will help us keep in our economy about 66 billion naira monthly. The more, as the money in our economy is increasing, poverty will be reducing. Because when people make money, what do they spend money on? They will build more houses, jobs will be created. They will buy cars, they will sell clothes, jobs will be created. And the last one is trade, which we intend to make Kogi a trade center. Our state is the gateway between the north and the south. So what we intend is the southerners go to the north to get food to the south. Uh, northerners go through Kogi, to go to Abba, go to Nisha, go to Lagos to get goods over to the north. So what we intend to do is to turn Kogi to a trade center. Everything you can get from the north, we make them available in Kogi. Everything from the south, we make them available in Kogi. So our state will become a trade center where people are coming to buy and to sell. Being a gateway state, we are surrounded by 10 states. Oh, with a population of about 56 million people. So you can imagine just targeting 15 million people to feed at 500 naira per day, that would be about 7.5 billion naira on a daily basis in circulation in our economy and about 750 billion every 100 days. Who are those that will make money? Now farmers will make money, traders will make money, logistics, transporters will make money, processing will make money, storage will make money, packaging will make money. When they make money, what spend that disposable it comes on. I mean, they will, they, will, they will build houses, jobs will be created. They will buy cars, jobs will be created. Imagine if 1 million people can only afford five caftans in a whole year. That means about 25 million years of caftans to be sold in our state. And at 6,000 Naira per caftan means about our tailors will make it about 30 billion Naira annually. Now, when tailors make money, what do they spend the money on? They will eat. The money goes oh, oh, Mr. The Bayamon. back to the farmer. In that circle, increasing these are in circulation and helping to take poverty out of our state. Yeah. You know, um, these are, you know, pretty interesting plans. Um, I'm sure the people of uh, Kogi State will be excited to not just um, see these things come to fruition, but, you know, also benefit from that. Yeah, you believe, know, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, I, would... I believe also, uh, I don't know if you have your PPC, Kogi. Uh, I feel you want to move your PPC down to Kogi State as well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not a resident in Kogi State, or not that I live there. But um, we'll, we'll see how things turn out on Saturday. You know, I think you know it was important that I started with the first question, which is on violence. And we hope that people of Kogi State are able to completely shun violence and exercise their civic responsibilities. INEC also, um, you know, uh, make sure that the, the elections, you know, of course, turn out to be free and, you know, uh, credible uh, to every one of the candidates. Who, of course, wish you the best of luck. And we'll speak with you hopefully after the elections. 
Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank Good you. morning.